Um, good afternoon. I think we're working now. <laughs> um, I, I know it's a beautiful day outside, but we're going to get through this, and then you guys are going to stay here even longer. So for those of you that aren't aware of this or forgot, the alumni thesis panel is taking place in this room from 6 to 8. Um, the good news is you get pizza, so you will be fed. Um, so anyway, uh, you're going to be here for a while, so sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. Um, I want to just go over the papers again. There's a little bit of confusion, so here's what you need to do. For your paper, you need to choose two papers, put the PDFs of the papers in your Dropbox. Email me what your paper topic is, otherwise I won't know to look in your Dropbox. Um, so you could say that you wanted to um, look at the association between beef and hypertension, or meat intake and hypertension. So if you were doing that, your two papers need to have the same exposure, so both deal with meat as one of the variables that they're looking at in relationship to the same outcome, um, I forgot what I said, cardiovascular disease, whatever you want it to be. Um, the studies, one can be a case control, one could be a cohort, they could both be cohort, one could be a randomized controlled trial, one a cohort, it can be any mixture of studies. They just have to be looking at the same exposure and the same outcome and it has to be nutritionally related. Um, any questions? So my plan is that I'm getting, you know, quite a few more of these paper topics approved. So by the end of the week, I'll post what I have so far so that you'll be able to see what topics are already taken. And for those of you that haven't chosen something, it might give you an idea of what, you, what kind of topic might be appropriate. So, um, you know, by the end of this week, I should post that. Any questions? Okay, so today we're going to cover case control studies, um, and so I just want to go back and cover two things from last week. So remember we talked about prevalence, we talked about incidence, and just remember that prevalence is equal to incidence times duration. And as I said during lecture last week, this is a relational formula, not a mathematical formula. I don't expect you to, you know, say, you know, 20 equals 4 times 100, you know, 20 times 4 equals 100. It's not like that. It's more if you have prevalence increasing, one of the others, incidence or duration, has to be increasing. So to understand how they relate to each other, that if you have incidence going up and duration is staying the same, then prevalence has to go up. So that's what I want you to understand about that formula. Um, the other thing is last week we talked about um, cross-sectional studies and that what we do is we're comparing the prevalence of disease in the exposed compared to the non-exposed um, or we can um, look at the prevalence of exposure in the diseased and non-diseased. In the papers they did an odds ratio and at the end of class today we'll talk about how they calculated it um, in terms of like I think it was a logistic regression so we'll go through a brief example so you understand that. But in general think of this as just looking at the relationship of this divided by the relationship of that. It's not exactly accurate because that is not how they did it in the paper, but that's how I want you to think about it. We're comparing how much disease do we see in a group of population that is com exposed compared to the people that are not exposed. Or if we look at everyone with the disease, like on this side, what proportion of them will actually have been exposed? And is it more than what would have been exposed in the non-diseased panel? So this B group. So does that make sense? All right, and we are going to cover odds ratio a lot more as we go through time. So, you know, just to put this in the wording of your paper last year, it could, I mean last week, it could be the prevalence of eating trans fat in people with adenoma as compared to the prevalence of eating trans fat in people without adenoma. So that's pretty much what the paper was getting at. They did it mathematically, not this simplistically, but that was the general idea of what the odds ratio was representing. Okay, so um, case control studies. When we talk about case control studies, there's two groups. Um, one group has the disease of interest, your cases, and the comparable group is free from the disease or your controls. Um, the case control study identifies possible causes of disease by finding out how these two groups differ with respect to exposure to some factors. So um, 
the characteristics of the case control study kind of points out what some of the limitations are and you know what its pitfalls are so one thing is that it's a single point of observation it's defined by the presence or absence of the outcome or the disease and the exposure is always asked about retrospectively we're talking to someone today and we're asking them what did you eat in the past and that's what we mean by retrospectively um, in a case control study you do not get incidence data so um, because you're creating groups of people you're creating a case group and a control group so you have no idea out of the whole population how many people are getting the disease or incident cases so um, the case control study is once you have an idea like the a, cross-sectional studies kind of point us towards potential ideas to study further. Once you have an idea, you have a potential association. Um, then you want to look at this, and it's often that you start out with a case control study, um, where you're trying to see the relationship between some exposure and some disease or outcome. So again, you start out with your people with disease, those are your cases. You get a group of people without the disease, your controls. A lot of what we'll talk about later today is how do we actually figure out what's a good control group, what are our concerns. And then for both of these groups, we're going to think back into time and say, for each of the groups, what proportion were exposed and what proportion were not exposed. And so schematically, it's shown here. So you have people that have the disease, they're labeled as your cases, We'll talk about how we get these people and how we assemble the cases. And then we ask them back in time to see if they were exposed or if they were not exposed. And then we also choose a group that's supposed to somehow represent the case group or at least the population from where they came. And these people will now have the disease and they will be your controls. Yes. Yes, the exposure here is asking about, like, your disease is your outcome, and the exposure is what leads to the disease. So the exposures here, um, so some of the case control studies I did was um, diet and prostate cancer. So I had people that had the disease, they had prostate cancer, I had controls that did not have the disease. Those people we chose to be pe um, men that were on the orthopedics floor and were coming here for, like, a hip replacement or a knee replacement, we matched them by age. So we had our cases, we had a control that was fairly similar. We would ask them about their diet in the past. We gave them all a food frequency questionnaire. Then we could ask and see, well, the people that have prostate cancer, were they um, less likely to have had a high lycopene diet? And were the controls more likely to have more lycopene? So you know, and so you've asked them about tomatoes and things that include lycopene, you go back and you say, okay, what nutrients are related? Um, another case control study that I've been involved in was um, the cases had hip fracture, and the controls in that case were neighborhood controls, so we would go to the doors adjacent to where the person lived and see if we could find someone as old as the hip fracture case um, in the same general neighborhood. And there we asked about falling risk, we asked about diet, we had a lot of different exposures. And that's the thing, you normally in any study are not looking at one exposure. As long as you've got the people there, you're asking them a lot of questions. Not too many, so they don't want to be interested, but that's the general idea of what you're doing. Then once you get this information, you're going to put it into one of these fourfold tables that we kind of introduced last week, but you'll get used to them as time goes on. So first you select your case with the disease, you get controls without disease that somehow are matched and hopefully you know, from about the same population. And then you put people into these little cells. So if they have the disease, so say it was the prostate cancer and diet, so they had the disease and they were exposed, so what if this was a high fat diet? Then they go here. So my exposure is high fat, we're not exposed as low fat, this is prostate cancer and orthopedics. And then here we're looking at what proportion of the controls had a high fat diet. If fat is related to prostate cancer, we're gonna see more people in A than we are in B. So we're looking at the proportion of all of the cases that had the exposure. So whether it's high fat or whatever your exposure is, as compared to the proportion of controls that had that same exposure. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so um, we're going to keep going back to mathematical examples in a little bit, but let's just discuss this a little bit more. So case control studies have a lot of advantages. That's why we do them. Um, first of all, it's a shorter time to complete as compared to a cohort study. When you do a case control study, the people already have the disease, so you just assemble a group that are cases and controls. When you do a cohort study, you start with everyone without disease, and you follow them forward over time until they get disease. So obviously, that takes a longer amount of time. Um, there is a smaller sample size required, so therefore, it's cheaper. Um, you know, most of the case control studies that I did were somewhere between 100 and, you know, 600 people, um, 100 in each size, in each um, group, the cases and the controls. So they can be cheaper. The other very important thing is that if you have a really rare disease, it may be the only practical way to try and get at what are the risk factors for that disease. So for example, if the rate of a disease is 1 in 10,000, if you did a cohort study, just think of how many people you'd have to follow to get enough cases to make sense out of what are the risk factors and what are not. Yes. Why is there a smaller sample? So if you're doing a cohort study, so say there's, you know, 10,000, you might want to follow like um, 10,000 people in order to get enough people that get disease in the end. With the case control study, you're choosing people that already have disease and matching them to some other group that doesn't have disease. So your sample size has to, can be very small because you're choosing people already with disease. So like if I wanted to look at hip fracture rates in a cohort study, I might need 50,000 people in order to get enough people that I would follow over time that get hip fracture to compare them to the people that don't and see what the risk factors are. When I did the case control study, we had like 150 cases, 150 controls. So it just takes a lot less people. Other questions? <coughs> However, there are limitations to the case control studies. Um, information on the potential risk factor may not be available from records of the patient. So sometimes we try and do a case control study just identifying people within the hospital and looking at their records. Um, that's not the best way. Everyone I've ever done, we actually do an interview. But you could do something like this. Um, also, information on important confounders may not be available. This is up to the person planning the study to make sure that they look at potential risk factors. But when we talk about um, confounders in a little while, I believe it's vitamin E. If you're doing a study of vitamin E, it turns out it might be important to know whether or not people are on statins. Well, if you were doing a study of vitamin E 10 years that started 10 years ago, you might not have asked about statins. So how are you then going to control for it? If you don't have the data, you can't control for it. Um, the other thing is you can't determine cause and effect. And we're going to talk a whole lecture about causality um, after your midterm, and you'll understand a little bit more of this. But you know, you're, there are so many chances that there's bias or that there's confounding or something else that's making your results. And I'll give you a couple of examples during this lecture that's making you have kind of a false result. Um, and the other thing is with case control, although they already have the disease and say you're asking about past exposure, you don't know whether you're really getting past exposure or if you're actually looking at some impact of the disease. Um, Getting a case group that's um, representative of all cases may be difficult. A lot of times this study design is used when people are always hospitalized for the outcome. So for both things I mentioned, prostate cancer and um, hip fracture, everyone with a hip fracture pretty much needs surgery, and so they're going to go to the hospital. With prostate cancer, you might get a lot of them, but the very um, Less severe cases may not go to the hospital. It might be that they go to their urologist's office. So you have to think about, does everyone go to treatment in a hospital if that's where you're getting your cases from? And then the biggest problem with case control studies is making sure you have a good control group. Because if you have the wrong control group, it can really make you believe that you have um, an association where one doesn't really exist. And we are going to go through an example of control group in a little while, because it is so key to this whole thing. <clears throat> so case control studies can give you leads that then can be followed up by a more definitive cohort design. Um, again, as I just mentioned, it's best suited for a study of a disease where people usually go for medical care. 
and especially if you're going to do it out of a hospital you need to make sure that they end up going for hospital care at some point during their disease also it's important to try and think about this for diseases that have a pretty rapid onset because you're asking them say in the prostate cancer case control study I did where we were asking them about their diet during the year before they got sick well if their disease took like 10 years to develop like say if they had cardiac disease and they've already had hypertension high cholesterol all of these things then are you really looking at risk factors before the disease developed so if you were looking at say stress and heart disease how would you know which came first if you're asking someone about that has heart disease you know what were your levels of stress like in the years before or did stress really relate to the onset of the disease or is it something they now have because of the diagnosis so it's hard to tease out things but you really want to try and think about the first lecture when or a second lecture when I talked about the disease process and where they are in for each disease where does it go from being healthy to maybe seeking care to going to the hospital and maybe dying think about where along that spectrum you might get the people into your study so this is almost like a history lesson this is diastole vestral or DES and vaginal cancer this was a study that was done a long long time ago it was one of the only examples in my lifetime that I can think of where a very small case control study with eight people was able to eight cases and 32 controls is what they had and they were able to stop the use of DES that had been used in women to try and prevent miscarriages so it was used quite a bit in women at risk of miscarriage and they would be given this drug and then what people noted is that when these girls got older that they ended up having pretty high rates of vaginal cancer and so through this one small case control study they basically took that drug off the market and again it starts with someone being aware and saying you know what this is strange I've had two cases of vaginal cancer in young girls that I wouldn't have expected and both of them had mothers that took DES and so then they go on and do a study and see this so in this case there were eight different cases and this is whether or not the case had been exposed to DES and so of the cases only one was not and then what you'll find is sometimes they'll do more than one control per case and in this case they had four match controls per case so that's how you end up with 32 controls so for every case they matched four different people and you can see that all of the people that were the match controls there was absolutely no DES exposure so this was an example of I told you that usually the case control study is used to develop further study this is a case where the case control study was all they needed to kind of take action and change policy yes so there's the issue called power which I kind of talked about briefly last week that the larger your sample size the more likely you are to see see a finding if one truly exists see an association if one truly exists it gives you a little more power to have more controls per case however it's like rate limiting so typically more than three or so is not usually that effective in trying to help you with the power the other thing is that in case you have and we'll go through multiple control groups in a little while sometimes you choose different control groups to try and control for some some variable that you think is going to get in the way and when I go through the example that'll be more clear but you know it gives you a like what if you only had a one-to-one match and for some reason all of the controls you chose were somehow biased they weren't really normal having more controls per case helps get rid of that so it gives you more power and then it also may make sure that you don't have a biased or unusual control group you're comparing to is there another question Jasmine okay so I'm gonna go through an example this is looking at vitamin A and hip fracture
Um, there are some data that actually indicated that high dose vitamin A may increase the risk of hip fracture. This was typically related only to retinol, not to carot carotene and some other sources of vitamin A. So um, someone set out to do a hip fracture study. And because hip fractures are relatively rare, they are ideal for a case control study. Um, we also know we can identify all cases of hip fracture because all will come to medical attention. Most will come to the hospital um, and require a hospital stay. Um, the control group, you have different options, but um, it's possible to get a control group that is of a similar age and the same gender. Um, in this case, we used matched neighborhood controls, as I told you. And here our exposure is looking at supplemental vitamin A. So whether or not people took, you know, vitamin A supplements. So just to put it out into like a schematic, so we had 180 hip fracture cases and 604 controls. So a one to three ratio here. Um, so we had the hip fracture cases, there were 180 of those. The neighborhood controls, there were 604 of those. And then we asked them in a questionnaire a whole lot of things, but what I'm showing you here is only one exposure that we're gonna focus on. And it was like, did you take a vitamin A supplement or did you not? And so we ask it the same way of both the cases as well as the controls to try and get at who took vitamin A and who did not. So here, our vitamin A supplement use is our exposure that we're interested in. So here, when we take the information and put it into one of these fourfold tables, this is what we get that there were 140 cases that took vitamin A, and there were 300, and, se um, and that's 140 out of 180, and there were 370 of the controls that took vitamin A. And so in this case, unexposed, it's just they did not take supplemental vitamin A. So we can look at this data and say, okay, this is one of the fourfold tables like we have to get used to looking at, and this is kind of the schematic. So you, we've selected our cases, hip fracture, our controls, we're neighborhood controls, and what's our exposure? So it's vitamin A supplement use and um, not using vitamin A supplements. And we can look at the proportions that were exposed in this case control study. So what proportion um, peop of people use vitamin A um, or were exposed? So here we have in the cases, it's 77% of the cases, and in the controls, it's 61% of the controls. So it looks like there could be a little bit of a difference, but we still can't really tell. We haven't gone all the way. So now we're going to say, okay, what is the odds that someone um, use vitamin A if they're in the case group? And that would be the number of exposed cases divided by the number of unexposed cases. So it's 140 divided by 40. Or if we think about the percents that we had, uh, um, could also look at, it was 77.8% of the cases used vitamin A, and 22.2 did not. So the odds of vitamin A use is just dividing those, and you get 3.5. We do the same exact thing for the controls. So in the controls, the odds of vitamin A use in the control is 370 used vitamin A, 234 did not. So that's your number exposed controls divided by number unexposed controls. If we think of this as a percent, it's 61.3 divided by 38.7. Either way, you're going to come up with 1.6. So the odds <coughs> of vitamin A use in the controls was 1.6. So if we wanted to get the odds ratio, what we normally do is we make the control group equal to 1. So instead of saying, you know, 1.6 for the controls, you'll see this in all the tables of the case control studies you use. The referent group is always just made to be 1. So in order to make this 1, we divide by 1.6. So then we have to do the same thing to the cases. Um, so we've made that into one, and so our odds ratio is just going to be the ratio of 2.2 divided by one, or 2.2. So um, I just want to go back to something. So if you, you know, 
the one other way we can do this, so this I've walked you through so that you can kind of understand logically what we're looking at. Um, what are the odds that we're really talking about? What is the odds ratio we're really talking about? But you will never be expected to go through these three steps to calculate an odds ratio. It actually is much more simple. And in fact, what you have to do is put the people into this fourfold table. So this is looking at cases and controls where the cases have coronary heart disease. And our exposure here is smoking and non-smoking. So we put everyone into the table. We had 200 cases, 400 controls, so a one to two um, match. And of the con cases, 112 of the 200 smoked. Of the controls, 176 out of 400 smoked. In reality, when we want to calculate an odds ratio, and this is the formula I do expect you to know, it's going to be AD divided by BC. And so if you do that, you come out with 1.62. Now, the reason is that, you know, normally we're looking at A over A plus B divided by C over C plus D. But I said you do uh, um, case control studies when the disease is rare. That's when they're idea, ideal. So when they're rare, your numbers are going to be um, very small. So we're really going to be looking at A over B divided by C over D or AD over BC, and that's your cross product term. I don't care if you get any of this down here. What I want you to make sure you understand is this, the table, and how you would use the cross products to calculate an odds ratio. So just to make it a little more clear, let's go back to our vitamin A use and think about how are we calculating the odds ratio here. Remember the people that were exposed to vitamin A is the um, 140. The cases that were not exposed is 40. We take these and we do a cross product. So we do A times D divided by B times C. So in this case, it's 140 times 234. And we divide that by 370 times 40. And what do we get? 2.2. And that is the same number that we got after going through those multiple steps. Yes? Is that the numbers that are in the This, the numbers in your table have nothing to do with the small. What it has to do with the small is that we're thinking about the bigger picture. So in the bigger picture, we have a rare disease, and that's what is small. So it has nothing to do with what's in your table. It has everything to do with is the disease rare or not. This is a shortcut, but you wouldn't do this study design, is the reality, if it's going to be more rare. And I'm going to go through an example, like if you had a cohort study, how this relates to cohort study calculation. Um, in the back there. Right, so people that take vitamin A supplements are um, twice as likely to be patients with prostate cancer. And you have to be very careful about how you really phrase it. The truly accurate, like you have the general idea, and that is correct. The real idea is that if you have prostate cancer, you're 2.2 times as likely to have taken vitamin A supplements as if you don't have prostate cancer. You know, you have to be careful not to imply risk from a case control study. So the first way you said it, you will see that all the time in papers, but it's not really accurate. The accurate way is just to say that the exposure is 2.2 times as likely. Was that your question, too? Yes. Okay. Did you have a question, sir? If there's no association, you're going to expect an odds ratio of okay. one. You cannot calculate a p-value from a four-fold table. Okay. The way that you're going to get a p-value is because normally you're going to use more advanced statistics than this. Okay. And when you do the statistics, you'll find out whether or not it's significant. And I'll go through logistic regression, which most of the papers you read, that's what they're doing because they want to control for a whole lot of things. So I'll go through how that actually works at the end of um, the lecture today. Anything else? So. Um, some of your questions will be answered in the future. but So what you could say is the odds of using vitamin A are 2.2 times greater in hip fracture cases than in the neighborhood controls, or the odds of hip fracture are 2.2 greater in those exposed to vitamin A than in the unexposed. 
Um, and notice how it's the odds of hip fracture. You're not using that word risk. And that's because risk is based on incidence. We don't get incidence from case control studies. Because it is a rare disease and because of the way the math works it, we would expect that if we did this same study looking at vitamin A and hip fracture in a um, cohort study, we would get about the same odds ratio as what we got here because it's a rare disease. And we'll go through a mathematical example of that. So um, an answer to the other question. So the interpretation of an odds ratio, if it's equal to one, it implies there is no association. And that's why in the lecture last week and again today, when I talk about whether or not an odds ratio is significant, I say if it includes one, then it's not significant. Because if it includes one, it means there's a chance there is no association. Um, so if we can assume statistical significance, so if we did the math and we got a p-value less than 0.05 or a confidence interval, say that was um, 1.5 to 2.8, then we could say that the, um, the cases were twice as likely as the controls to have been exposed. Now, we're not always looking at risk factors. So for today, I wanted you to switch the way of thinking and look at the vitamin D in the breast cancer. And there you could see that some of these odds ratios in those papers were less than one. And what that's looking at is a potential protective factor against the disease. And just like the other one, if the, odds ratio, if the confidence interval includes one, that it's not significantly protective. So just think of one as being null association, no association. If it's in that 95% confidence interval, it means there is a chance that there is no association. Yes? So look, if, if in this example, instead of 2.2, what if vitamin A, we did this study, and instead of being a risk factor like we thought, we ended up with an odds ratio of 0 0.5? Then we would have to say that your odds of getting the disease are 50% of that, you know, if you take vitamin A, are 50% less than if you don't take vitamin A. It is, but it can be that you're 50 percent. It's not 50 percent likely to have taken. So if you go back to here, so look at it right here. So the odds of hip fractures, say, are 2.2 greater in those exposed to vitamin A than in the unexposed. So instead, it would be the odds of hip fracture are 50 percent less in those exposed to vitamin A than in those that were unexposed to vitamin A. Yeah, it can go either way, and that's what happens, you know, for the papers that we looked at. You would see that it was both directions, protective as far as, and also risk. Anything else? Yeah. So what I mean is that um, take more vitamin D and you'll be protected against breast cancer. For the papers that we read today, if you have a higher intake of vitamin D or if you had more sunlight exposure when you were a teen, you may have less risk of developing breast cancer later in life. So that's what the protective factors are. Yes? Um, in reality, that is usually done through a mathematical equation that I'm going to go at the end of the lecture and go through the, um, like a logistic regression or something, and that's where it would come from. So it's really, you can calculate a confidence interval with certain statistics, but most of the time this is done through like a black box kind of thing in the computer where you're doing logistic regression or some other proportional hazards or some other statistical method that will give you both the odds ratio and in the printout it'll give you the other. So if you take statistics in the spring, that might be where you learn more how to calculate a confidence interval. It's a little bit beyond this, but I'm going to cover it. Um, as best I can with a few slides. Any other questions? Okay. So um, the odds ratio is a good approximation of risk or the relative risk, which we're going to talk about next week with the cohort studies, under certain conditions. 
So we don't do case control studies because we know that the value of the odds ratio is not so great. We do it because we think that under certain conditions, it really is going to give us almost as good an estimate as if we did a huge cohort study. And the indications for when we're going to get a better approximation of the relative risk is, first of all, the controls are representative of a target population. And I'll go through an example of that, that the cases are representative of all cases, and that the frequency of disease in the population is small, or that the disease is rare. So again, always have like that buzzword, case control, rare, good. You know, then our odds ratio is a pretty good estimate of the relative risk. So here is, um, again, without having had the cohort study lecture, I just want you to kind of follow through and see what we're talking about here. So remember we said that the case control study is cheaper because you need less people. So here in this reality was a cohort study. So they needed 10,000 people exposed, 10,000 unexposed. They followed them forward, and out of these 20,000, only 300 got disease. That's why you need more people in a cohort study. So this would be an example of a cohort study. And what we'll talk about next week is calculating the relative risk. And it's basically how many people got the disease out of those exposed divided by how many people got the disease out of those unexposed. And in this case, we get two. If instead we said this is, um, this is a rare disease, so it should work. Let's see what the odds ratio is. You can see that when you calculate the odds ratio, you get almost the same estimate. So using that cross product term with AD divided by BC, you can see you get almost the same thing for an odds ratio. And that is because this is a rare disease. Yes? Is there a question? So if you have a rare disease, a case control study is going to be better, mostly because of cost. So in order to get these 300 cases, we had to follow 20,000 people. Right. It's, it's a good way of assessing it, and under these assumptions that I just told you, with one of them being that the frequency is rare, it's a pretty good estimate of what you would have gotten if you did a cohort study. Now, um, so it is related to the cost, because if instead this was a case control study, I would have had 300 cases and only maybe 600 controls. So my whole study would have been 900 people instead of 20,000. Yes? Um, you know, I think it's more or less there isn't an exact number, but um, let me just go ahead one. Oops, I thought I had one more slide. Um, you know, if you're dealing with something like this, it's just obvious this is more rare, 300 out of 20,000. If you were dealing with, say, a cold and it was, you know, 60 out of 200, that's not rare. So, I mean, you're talking about things where you have to talk about cases per thousand, typically. And, you know, the reason why that's hard to answer is because, well, what population are you talking about? You know, if I was talking about hip fracture risk, it might be, you know, one in 200 if you're over the age of 80. But if you're under the age of 80, it's going to be, you know, so it all is very hard to kind of come up with an exact number. But you will have a gut feeling. And also, in general, cancer is rare. Heart disease, not so rare. You know, you have like one in two people getting heart disease, but in, you still could do a case control study with um, heart disease, but maybe more specific kinds, you know, breaking it down into specific cardiovascular disease components, say stroke or whatever. So it's, it's hard to give you a number that is rare, but you kind of just have a gut feeling. So things like colds, asthma, arthritis, these things are not rare. They're, you know, rampant. Even osteoporosis, you can't do a case control study because that's like one in two women. If we're talking about hip fractures, that's a rare event within osteoporosis. Okay. So um, just some examples of what we could sit, consider to be case control studies. Something like green, green tea consumption and lung cancer. 
So you get lung cancer cases, you get controls from, say, some other ward on the hospital, um, and then you ask everyone about their green tea consumption. Um, and in this case, you wouldn't want to do, like, say, lung cancer compared to gastric cancer, because then, you know, that's not a good control group. They all have cancer, and what if the chemo or whatever they're taking um, impacts their diet, or what if the progression of the disease impacted their diet? You want something that's less likely. So, for example, when we did the prostate cancer, we chose orthopedic controls, because other than the fact that they needed a replacement, they were normal and healthy and living in the community until that time point in time. So they were a better control group. Um, you might want to look at whether or not a mother had anesthesia and whether there were fetal birth defects. So you would have a group of um, mothers of babies that had um, fetal birth defects and compare them to mothers of healthy babies, ask them about their prior anesthesia use during the, um, during the pregnancy and before perhaps. Um, passive smoking at home and risk of acute MI. So again, MI, you know, for having an acute MI, that's still considered a fairly rare disease. Um, and so you would get people with acute MI and maybe compare them to some other control group that's on the hospital ward um, or maybe neighborhood controls you would use. And you would ask them both about whether or not there was a smoker within the house, not themselves, but if they were exposed to smoke either at work or at home in order to get at that. So just ideas of the kind of um, scenarios that would be case control studies. So um, the odds ratio, if the exposure is associated with the disease, we're going to expect that the proportion of cases who were exposed would be greater than the proportion who were not exposed, than the proportion of controls who were exposed. Now, this is assuming that it's a risk factor instead of a protective factor. And again, the way we calculate this is by the cross product. So just to go through another example of the cross product, this is a study that was done um, back when the first artificial sweeteners came out. There was some concern that it had shown um, cancer in some laboratory animals. So they started doing studies of, well, does artificial sweeteners um, cause bladder cancer in people? So cancer, again, is a fairly rare event. So they collected um, a group of cases and a group of controls. And they asked them, did they ever use artificial sweeteners, yes or no, or ever and never in this case. And so knowing that we have a case control study, we have our A, B, C, D. We can do that cross product calculation. So here's our odds ratio. We're going to take 1,293 um, 1, times 3,321. So doing AD, and then we're going to divide it by BC. So um, 1,707 times 2,455. So here we end up with an odds ratio of 1.02. So what does that mean? You know not really associated, you know, you don't have a strong association. So here, if we go through this as an example, um, we had 1,293 out of 3,000 cases that used artificial sweeteners, or 43%, 2,455 out of almost 6,000 controls used sweeteners, so that's about 42.5%. So again, our odds ratio that we did by the cross product was 1.02. So you could say the odds of using artificial sweeteners are 1.02 times greater in bladder cancer cases than in the controls, and this is not a significant difference. You know, that's nothing. It's um, not elevated at all. Or you could say the odds of bladder cancer are 1.02 times greater in those exposed to artificial sweeteners than in those unexposed. So again, just examples of what are the um, odds ratios, how do we interpret them, how do we calculate it from a fourfold table. This is all stuff that you should understand. Sometimes our exposure is not dichotomous. It's not, you know, did you use an artificial sweetener, yes or no. It's how much did you use. We want to look at those people that say drank five Diet Cokes a day versus maybe they only had one a day in another group versus none. And so sometimes our exposure is actually stratified by dose so that we can see if there's a dose response. So this is an example um, where smoking, um, the exposure is not equal to just yes or no, but instead we wanted to see, based on how many cigarettes they had um, per day, 
how did that impact the lung cancer? And so you can see that for those people that you know, were heavy smokers, this is like two and a half packs um, per day, that 38 per, um, of the people with lung cancer of the 1,300 fell into that highest category, where only 12 of the um, same number of controls fell into that highest exposure category. And in reality, you could calculate an odds ratio for each one of these exposure levels. You could kind of pretend that nothing else exists in this table except for 761 and um, 38 and 12, you know, and you could calculate your odds ratio for each level. But instead, the best way is to do it with statistical modeling and things that are a little bit harder to explain here. Yes? Sorry, so it's by any means? Not significant difference. So if there's no significant difference, sometimes we get tired of saying that when we're always writing, you know, like I'll do output for a whole study and then I'll go over it with some of the doctors I work with and I just do NSD because then they know there's no significant difference there and it's not important. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the logistics of actually doing a case control study. So first of all, who are your cases going to be? So you need to define a case conceptually. So say in the hip fracture, it was anyone who shows up to the hospital with a hip fracture. Well, am I using any hip fracture? Does it have to be a fracture of the femoral neck or which portion of the hip broke an intertrochanteric fracture? You know, what am I doing? How am I defining it? Who is my case? You have to define it and define it clearly. Um, and also one of the things that you sometimes want to do, I talked about the difference between incidence and prevalence, but sometimes we talk about having incident cases in a case control study. And all that means is that it still is a case control study, you still can't calculate risk, but as soon as they get the disease, we're putting them in the study. So if someone came in with prostate cancer that had had it for three years, they would not be allowed in the study if I was doing it on incident prostate cancer cases. It would only be those that were coming in for the first time for their prostate cancer. And so all of these come into defining who is your case going to be. Um, ideally, you want to have some way of identifying and enrolling all incident cases in a defined population in a specific um, time period. One of the great things for cancer was the start of these tumor registries um, because now everybody has to report any cancer to a tumor registry. So if you're doing a case control study, you can say go to the state of New Jersey and say I would like to do a study. Can I use your tumor registry to contact all the people? And after certain paperwork, you know that you're pretty much getting all cancer cases in New Jersey. Or you could do it just for one specific hospital. You could do it for the United States with the um, SEER data, S-E-E-R, like surveillance and epidemiology um, data for cancer. Yes? It's what you, so your population could be anything that you define it to be. But whatever you define it to be is the only group that you can say your results apply to. So if I am doing, um, like I'm involved in an Alzheimer's disease population, um, it's a cohort study, but it's in northern Manhattan, you know, in Wood Washington Heights, this section here. So when we, we let males and females, everybody in, but when we go to, re, you know, it, the results are based on a cohort in this area. So you can have your New Jersey data on only females and say this, um, in women in the United States, this happens, because New Jersey women might be different from others. Yes? You'll see a lot of them come out of, you know, like Sweden does have a great, you know, healthcare records and you could, you know, they have great mammography cohorts and things like that. So it doesn't have to come out of there. Um, there are, you know, different registries within the United States. There also are um, different cohorts that have been going on for a very long time that also can apply, supply cases in something that we'll talk about later, a nested case control study. Um, so I'm trying to think of what the name of it is, but there's a European um, EPIC is a cohort study that's done in Europe looking at cancer throughout Europe. 
Um, and then, as I said, we have some like groups in the United States that also gather all the cases. So it's definitely easier to do if you have great registries within your country. You could do it for your whole country. Like here, it's a lot harder because different states have different registries, and it's not as clear that we could get as good a record, say, for the United States as you might get for Sweden because they have better records. But it doesn't mean it can't be done. Okay. Um, so when you have a tumor registry, whether it's for a country like Sweden or for a state like New Jersey or a vital statistics bureau, they can give you a complete listing of all cases. You know, you have to go through a ton of paperwork and get IRB and everything, but you can get it. Um, medical facilities can be a source of cases. So for the prostate cancer study that I did, this was a long time ago, but we did it just based on Columbia Presbyterian um, patients, back when it was Columbia Presbyterian. Um, so medical facilities can be a source of cases, but again, it's not always incident cases, and so you have to decide, am I taking anyone with prostate cancer or anyone who has been diagnosed, say, within the past three months? You have to make those decisions before you set out to select your cases. So if you are selecting your cases based on a hospital, typically it's good to get more than one hospital. The other concern is that you have to think about referral patterns because not all the results may be generalizable. So for here, say um, heart surgery, Columbia gets a ton of patients here, and they're not coming only from Washington Heights Inwood just because that's where the hospital is located. They're coming here because they saw Dr. Oz on TV or because we have a great reputation. So these patients that come in to Columbia Presbyterian may not represent the typical population that lives around this area. So if I'm doing a case control study of, um, say, heart transplant patients, my heart transplant patients may be people that are very highly educated, that have a lot of money, all of that because we are a specialty referral hospital. And you have to understand that when you go to do your case control study. Because if that's the case, then you might want controls that you get from within this hospital or maybe neighborhood controls to those individuals that came in with um, heart transplant. So if you have a heart transplant patient that came from Englewood, New Jersey, you would try and get a control from Englewood, New Jersey. So maybe match them that way by what neighborhood they came from. Um, and these are the different things you have to think about. So, um, you know, how is your hospital, if you're doing a study in a hospital, does it just represent the community or is it a specialty hospital and has referral patterns that may differ for disease to disease? Um, you know, for example, if I was doing a cancer study, this may not be the same specialty hospital as if we went to an oncology-specific hospital. So if we went to Sloan Kettering, there you're definitely getting all the referrals from all over, and in part, that's an insurance-based thing. You know, many insurance policies say, you know, if you go to Sloan Kettering, everything will be covered. So if that's going to be the case, then you have to think carefully, okay, if these cases are coming from all over and they're within this plan, how am I best going to represent that in my control group? You may also get um, cases from a physician office if it's something like um, that you think that they will not go to a hospital, but it still is a rare disease, so good for a co um, case control study, you could go to a physician office. Um, some communities have patient registries. Um, there's not a whole lot of them. They're more now you know, statewide or national. And then also, do you want to look at incident or prevalent cases? And just remember, if you take prevalent cases like people that have had the disease for three years, are they really representative of all prostate cancer, or are they different because they survived three years? So you have to think about all of this when you go to choose um, your cases. And then the harder part is really trying to think about who is going to be your controls. So there's population-based controls. Um, where it's patients from the same hospital. It could be patients from the same hospital as the cases. It could be relatives of cases. It could be friends of cases. And this we call a SES, or a socioeconomic status control. So we assume that if they're friends, they probably are somewhat similar in terms of their socioeconomic status. Um, if you do it relatives of cases, they might be fairly similar, but if there's any genetic component, component of the disease, it's not the best choice, obviously. 
Um, you can choose people from the same hospital as the cases, but again, think about referral patterns and maybe how that would impact it. Um, I think in one of the papers today, they used more like a population-based control where they matched people by motor vehicle records. And there you're just going, or you could do it by, um, it used to work this concept of random digit dialing so that if your case came in and their phone number was 212606, then you would dial someone else 212606 with the last four digits being different. And that used to represent about the same geographic area. And you try and find someone of the right gender and age. Um, but now with cell phones and many people not having home phones and addition of all these different ex you know, um, three digits that used to represent an area, it doesn't work as well. You know, area codes have changed, and then the first three digits of the phone number also aren't as meaningful as they used to be. Okay, so your sources of the controls, you could have community controls. Um, this could be a probability sample where you um, just like randomly choose some people by telephone number, by, med um, by motor vehicle records. It could be no neighborhood controls, as I talked about. Um, the random digit dialing to match the neighborhood, the friend control. Um, hospitalized patients, it could be all other patients in the hospital except for those, say, with lung cancer, if you're doing a lung cancer study. Or it might be that you say, okay, I have lung cancer patients. I don't want anyone with cancer in my control group, so I'm going to choose people that are here for diabetes and heart disease. So you have to think about who is going to be your hospitalized patients and how can that impact your study. So there's different views on how we select controls. In general, um, people think that they should be similar to cases in all ways except for having the disease. So in general, you know, other than having the disease, they come from about the same environment. They're pretty similar in terms of what they eat. Um, the other question is, should they represent all people without the disease in the community? Um, from where the cases are selected. So not necessarily someone like a friend or um, a neighborhood control, but just someone that is in the larger community. Um, and again, when you have hospitalized patients, this is harder to determine. It's not like you're catching them at a doctor's office and then you can say, okay, anyone that goes to this doctor probably lives within a certain geographic area. So if I take a case from here, I'm going to take a couple of controls. Um, the problem is that if you have um, hospitalized patients, sometimes they're not like the community. Oftentimes, if you look at people who are hospitalized versus those in the community, the ones in the hospital may be more likely to be smokers, may exercise less. So there's certain features that you're going to get if your control are hospitalized. Um, but overall, what we're trying to do is if we find that there's a difference in exposure between our case group and our control group, we want to say it's not due to the selection of controls. We don't want that to be the whole reason why we found a difference. And so, you know, your controls, you want to try and avoid that. And it requires careful thinking. And I'll go through some examples of where it wasn't done that well. So first here, this is just to kind of think in terms of what I'm talking about here. If you have your cases, they all came out of this reference population from the total population. So say your cases are everyone in New Jersey um, that has cancer or whatever. That is your reference population. This might be the United States. So our controls, we don't want to go to Nebraska and other places to get controls for our New Jersey cases. We want to try and get the people in New Jersey that do not have cancer. So let's go through an example of um, a case control study where we can think about the control selection and how it was done. So the study was looking at cancer of the pancreas, a rare disease. Um, the cases were all um, white patients with cancer of the pancreas, and they came from um, hospitals in Rhode Island or Massachusetts, of which there were 11 different hospitals. The controls, they said, okay, well, we're getting all these cases of um, pancreatic cancer from gastroenterologists, so let's just take another patient with a different disease that was admitted by the same doctor. And so they figured, you know, they probably go to the same doctor because they live in the same community, and there's other reasons by which they would be similar. So they did the study, 
and they, um, the top few lines here are males and the bottom few are females. And this is looking at coffee consumption. So it goes from no coffee consumption up to um, more than five. And you're looking at the distribution of the um, cases and the controls. And the important thing here is the relative risk, which goes along this line. Now remember, we also talked about um, odds uh, confidence intervals. So all of these odds ratios exceed one. So they're talking about a risk factor. And if you look at these confidence intervals, all of them except for this one in the males is greater than one as well, indicating that, say, this is a significant finding, this is significant, this is not, because it includes one in the confidence interval. So this is going from zero to more than five cups per day. Um, and here we have it for females, where it's going from, you know, one, again, we made the reference group of no coffee as one, and it's going up to 3.1. And in this case, these two upper categories are both significant. So how would you describe the relationship between coffee drinking and pancreatic cancer? Yes. It seems like a dose response and be more specific. What happens as you drink more coffee? Right, so the more coffee you drink, the more likely it is um, that you have pancreatic cancer. So what's another risk factor besides coffee um, that maybe could impact pancreatic cancer? What's a major risk factor for cancer? Yeah. Right, smoking. So we know smoking is a strong risk factor for many um, cancers. So we stratify by smoking. And what that means is that we're looking now within categories of cigarette smoking, people that never smoked, people that were ex-smokers, or current smokers. And if we look at this, the coffee drinking cups per day, again going up here, what is going on with the odds ratios? Is there still um, an increased risk within each category of um, smoking for coffee drinking? So does coffee drinking increase your risk whether you smoke or not? Yes, right, it looks like the odds are going up. So I saw some head shaking, so we're gonna go with that. So as you increase your coffee intake, in current smokers, you still see an elevated risk. In ex-smokers, you still see an elevated risk. If they never smoke, you still see an elevated risk. You know, yes, maybe these numbers are a little different, but train yourself to look across the categories from zero to one to two to three. It goes up and up as you go over these categories. Um, in the back. Yes, so in this case, smoking is a confounder. And so one of the ways when we get to the confounding lecture that you deal with it is to stratify by a confounder to try and look at it. Yes? So you're saying it's bigger like 3.1 is greater than 2.6? Um, it's basically pretty much the same thing because the lower bounds of the confidence interval are not that different. This is going up to um, seven, and that seems a little higher, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's good to be higher because you have just greater spread there, so maybe there were fewer females in the group. It doesn't look like it, but you can't really compare across these two groups to say that this is you know, a much greater risk than this without doing a statistical test. Like, it's hard to really just look at it and say that it's stronger in one than the other. Yeah, I mean, if you saw a huge difference that was double or whatever, then I would say yes. But, you know, for here, like a 0.5 difference in the odds ratio, that's not that huge when you see how it varies across the categories. The difference between genders isn't that great. Yes. So smoking was considered a confounder. That is why they did the stratified analysis. Once they did the stratified analysis, they can see that in each level of smoking that the relationship still exists. So you do a stratified analysis to get rid of the effect of the confounder. If its confounding was 
the only reason we saw the association, you wouldn't see the risk still go up with different levels of smoking. Yes. Um, I think it's probably the size of the population. Like, I don't think, I think something like that is just random. You know, just like when he was asking about comparing the odds ratios, like to me, it's just elevated. And the fact that this doesn't really go in a dose response as much makes me think that maybe it is just, um, you know, noise in the measurement. This category here is not significant because it's including one. So the one to two isn't significant, whereas the, um, this one is. Right. Yeah, I mean, because you can say that overall in this group there wasn't a significant difference. Anything else? Okay, so let's think about it. So we have our pancreatic cancer, we have our controls. And so what we found basically is that the percent drinking coffee in the cases was much greater than the coffee drinking in the controls, correct? And that's why we said that that's related to the risk. But here's the idea. Was the level of coffee drinking in the controls the same as in the general population? You know, is this the expected level of coffee consumption in the general population? So who were the controls? Yes. Right, so other patients with gastrointestinal disease, right? So what do you think might happen to the coffee drinking of people with GI disease? Yes. Right, it might decrease. So if it's decreasing, are we really seeing that these people drink more coffee? Or is it that, in fact, this is the expected level of coffee consumption in the general population. And the only reason we saw this whole finding was because we chose the wrong control group. So, you know, it's something that, you know, they were doing it for ease. You know, okay, this doctor's already admitting. We'll take care of the fact that they're from the same area. They're probably the same socioeconomic status. They go to the same doctor. They probably, you know, have similar insurance, so maybe they have similar jobs. You know, there's a lot that went into choosing the control group. But the part that didn't go into it is if you're looking at a risk factor that maybe is related to that control group, you're going to run into problems. So in a case like this, you can do your whole study and come out with it and basically get nothing, you know, because in fact, it's really a false finding. It's just related to the fact that the um, coffee drinking in your controls was biased. It's not really that it elevates the risk of pancreatic cancer. It just decreases the likelihood of drinking in the controls. So it's just like an illustrative example to just see how important it is to really think about who your control group is going to be. Okay, so um, in terms of matching. Matching, you know, we talked about you might have, you know, three cases for every control or two or whatever. Um, Oftentimes, you want to match your cases and controls for potential confounders, things like age, race, sex, socioeconomic status, maybe occupation. It all depends on what risk factors you're looking at. If, in fact, you want to match, there are two different ways that you do it. One is group matching, where you select the controls so that a proportion of the controls have the same characteristic as a proportion of the cases. So for example, I have 20% of my case population is between the ages of 50 and 60. I want 20% of my controls to be between the ages of 50 and 60. That's frequency matching or group matching. We're just saying, you know, in general, have it be about the same per category. So if I have 20% of the cases in age 50 to 60, and then I have 20 fifth patient that comes in, am I going to take them? Maybe I won't, because in frequency, I have enough people to already say that I have as many controls as I want for that age. You can also do individual matching, 
And in that case, basically, for each case that's selected, a control is selected who is similar to case in terms of the variable of concern. So that if I have a 60-year-old female that comes in with colon cancer, I'm going to want a 60-year-old female without colon cancer to be her matched pair. And when you do it that way, your whole analysis is by paired analysis. In a couple of weeks, we'll come back to this concept and do some calculations. But um, it's a little more difficult to do that, and it's harder to make sure that um, it's just harder to recruit for it. Because if you have, you know, someone that's 57 with colon cancer, and then you keep looking for another 57-year-old female that, say, is in the orthopedic group, and they don't come in, they don't come in, it can cause difficulties. So you end up turning away people because you don't have a case to match them. And that's why the frequency matching is kind of preferred. And I would say that most of the studies that I've done have been done frequency matching. All right. So this is an example of an unmatched analysis where the disease is related to the confounding variable. So if we did, um, if we did an odds ratio of this table, can someone tell me for um, level one? What would be the odds ratio? So for the top table, the top fourfold table up here, what would we do for the calculation of the odds ratio? Yeah. Right. So 72 times 20 divided by 18 by 20, and that's equal to 4. Okay, so can someone tell me for group two, the second? Yes. Uh huh. Right. That is going to also equal four. Now, if I put these together, so this is like stratified by, so let's say this is smokers and non-smokers. But I haven't done that yet. I have the whole group together. So if I had the whole group together, can someone tell me now what my fourfold table would look like? So if I combined both of these levels, what am I going to have in the A box? Right, 77. And what's going to be over here? 52, 23, and 148. So now for this, what is my odds ratio going to be? Yeah. So it's 77 times 148 divided by... This equals 10, okay? So right now, if I just did this association and say, so this, let's call this smoke, and this is no smoking. But what we're really looking at in our fourfold table here, say, is um, vitamin D and um, I'm sorry, let's make this uh, cancer. And this is no cancer. And say we wanted to look at alcohol. And this is no alcohol. Okay, so do you get the scenario? So this is what we have here. So if you looked at simply alcohol and cancer, is there an association or not? Right? There is. So this is an unmatched analysis. We look at all this data. There appears to be association. Now, look back at this table here. And can you tell me what's unusual about um, how many cases there are at each of these levels of the confounder? Yeah. 
So if you look at the total number of cases, almost all of them are in this confounding level one. Almost all of them are smokers. So if we look at our cases, 90 out of the 100 were smokers. Only 10 out of the 100 were not smokers, right? So this isn't good because, you know, what, are we really looking at alcohol or are we looking at smoking? How is this going to come out to play? So now what we do is we do a matched analysis. So what happens here is that for every time we get a case, we're going to get a control. So we're not going to allow, so remember here, we had um, 90 here and 10 here, but look, we had 10 here and 160 controls we let in that were non-smokers. So now when we do it, we're saying, okay, we only want a two to one ratio of controls to cases. So if I'm letting 90 cases in that are smokers, I'm only letting 180 um, smoking controls in. Or if I only have 10 cases that are non-smokers, I'm only going to take 20 controls that are non-smokers. So the first time, you just let anyone in and it didn't matter. This time you said, okay, I'm going to match. If they, I'm matching on confounding level one and level two. So if I have people here, I'm going to have two twice as many people here, and same down here. So you don't let it just fall into whatever categories they get. So when we have this here, we still get four and four for our case control. Um, for our level one, this is still an odds ratio of four. This is still an odds ratio of four. But now when we combine them, and if we look overall at this alcohol and um, the alcohol and cancer, can someone tell me what the um, fourfold table now would be for this matched analysis? So we still have cancer and no cancer. We have alcohol and no alcohol. So how many people are we having in each of these boxes? What's going to be up here? So we're having 77. 23 and 106. Okay, so now we do our odds ratio. And what is the odds ratio? Remember the cross product term. I'm sorry. Just tell me the numbers first. So it's 77 times 106, and we're dividing that by um, 94 times 23. And someone said, had already gotten to this point and said it's 3.77 or something like that. So by matching for this confounding variable, we can find that really the association is only fourfold. It's not tenfold. So we exaggerated the effect of alcohol on cancer in this example because we didn't match on smoking. So we were not simply looking at alcohol here. It was all muddled up with smoking effect too. By matching on smoking here, we end up with getting odds ratios that are much more similar to the reality in each of the subgroups. So matching is important. It's just an illustration to show how we can um, get rid of the effect of the smoking by doing it this way. Yes? You can match for more than one if it's a really strong confounder. What you'll find when we do the confounding lectures, so say if it's, um, you could match by age and gender, because they're both confounders. So if you had a male of a certain age, you know, then you just do that. But if you have, you don't want to adjust for all confounders. There's other ways to handle confounders. We can put them in the model, so that in the papers you read where it says we controlled for X, Y, and Z at the bottom of the table, that also is controlling for confounders. So there's different ways to control for confounding. You don't always have to match, but it helps a lot if it's something that has such a strong impact. Yes? So by saying it's matched, you're saying that the three figures and the three degrees together can include the controls, whereas the odd matches can only have the three I let them all just come in, and by choosing the people, they fill into, fell into the categories where I had most of my controls being non-smokers and most of the cases being the smokers and that's not going to work because then you're you end up looking at smoking 
All right, so um, let's talk about information on exposure. So we talked about, I'm sorry, yeah. Well, what are you doing your results on? Are you doing it on that, or are you talking about this? You either did one study or the other, right? Sorry. You either did one study or the other. So this study, you started from the beginning and matched. So you can say, after controlling for smoking, alcohol still had a fourfold effect on um, cancer. In this one, you, you would only come up with that 10 there, and you wouldn't know what it's due to. So hopefully then, with that case, like this right side is all you'd have for that study. And in that case, hopefully, you would put smoking in the model and try and get rid of some of the effects. But in general, it's not going to erase the effect of smoking as much as the matching to begin with. Anything else? OK. So um, we talked about our controls and how we're going to get them, whether we're going to match them or not. We also have to ask about exposure of everyone. We want to make sure that when you ascertain the exposure, it's the same in the cases and controls. So you do not want someone going in to the interview, and so say for the diet and prostate cancer, we had people going out and interviewing the people with um, prostate cancer as well as the people with the fractures, or either fractures or hip re and knee replacement. So you don't want the person to go in to the prostate cancer patient and say, are you sure that you don't eat a lot more fried chicken, you know, when they give you the response? You don't want them probing and asking in a different way of the cases than controls because they maybe are biased and think that a certain finding should come out. You always want to ask it the same way. In this study, we also collected blood samples. And what we noticed is that as the nurse was going out and gutting the blood samples, we were always getting a morning fasting blood on the prostate cancer patients, but the orthopedic controls because they were out of physical therapy and occupational therapy, we didn't necessarily get blood till the afternoon. So then you have to think about the stuff that you're collecting. Is there any diurnal variation that maybe by difference in time collection, we would have a problem? And so you notice something like that after a few, and then you say, wait a minute, we have to change this and make sure they're all collected at the same time. One of the ways to avoid any bias in the data collection is if, say, I have um, a research assistant who's going into the hospital and abstracting medical records, I don't let them know what the hypothesis is. You don't want them to know that I'm looking for smoking and pancreatic cancer, so every time they get a pancreatic cancer chart, they look really carefully for smoking and don't really care about looking at the control group. Um, and so you want to just make sure also that Variables, if you're getting them from records, are routinely recorded. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at physical therapy and whether it improves outcomes of myocardial infarction, you want to make sure that the therapists always record the amount of hours of therapy they do, or you're not going to have that. Um, and then if you're doing any physical measures, you want to make sure that you're not doing anything that maybe is influenced by the disease process. So. Um, for example, if you were thinking about um, weight and you're taking someone's weight but they have cancer, well, how much weight have they lost? Do you really want the current weight or do you want to ask them what their weight was five years ago? Um, then you have to think about the wording of the questions. So you want to try and ask them about exposure that was before they got the disease. Um, so if you're talking about diet and colon cancer, it might not just be before you were diagnosed, but before you started feeling symptoms. What was your diet usually like? Think about the year before you started feeling any symptoms. What was your diet usually like? Um, if you're doing a study looking at ovarian cancer and weight, you're going to want to ask about weight several years before the diagnosis, um, or any weight loss due to the diagnosis is going to influence your findings. Um, sometimes you need to exclude people with symptoms more than a year ago. Um, so like if you're doing a study of MS and people without MS, if people have been experiencing, you know, symptoms for several years, it might be hard to ask them, well, what was your diet like before you started having the symptoms of MS? And that's why sometimes we prefer having the incident cases be part of our study. Okay. <clears throat>
So this is kind of the schema that we're looking at. We start with the people with the disease, without the disease. They come down here. Then we determine their exposure history, whether or not they were exposed. If the exposure is associated the, with the disease, we're going to expect that people with the disease are going to have much higher rates of exposure, and the people, the controls, without the disease are going to not be exposed. That's kind of what we expect to see if there really is an association, at least graphically, you know, what it would look like. So I'm just trying to think if we... Um, do you guys want like a 10 minute break now? We still have a lot to do. So why don't we just take a 10 minute break and then we'll finish the lecture, then we'll do the readings and then you have an assignment. So. was the effects that you found. So here's your relative risk. They're going up as coffee drinking goes up in the males, mm -hmm. and they're going up as coffee drinking goes up in the females. But then we said, okay, well, smoking we know is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer, so now let's control for smoking. The way you control for smoking is now you're looking at odds ratios. These are just the odds ratios for each of these groups mm -hmm. in the people. So this is everyone who never smoked, and even if you drink coffee, your odds still go up the more coffee you drink. If you were an ex-smoker, the odds still go up the more coffee you drink. Okay. If you're a current smoker, the odds still go up. Mm -hmm. So you're saying if it was, if it was only due to smoking, so we wouldn't see that? We wouldn't see that. Then only in the current smokers would you really see this association, and you'd see nothing in the others. Okay. And so because we see it? Then in every group, then it means it's not, con like, that it's a real result. Okay. So not and we're going to have a whole lecture on this. Okay. So, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know.
Hi. So it's just if you didn't, so for all the people that are in all three of these categories, what's the average thing? So this one should be, is like really the average of this two, and this 1.8 is kind of the average of these two. So in other words, it's just the sum of all of these. If instead of having people in each of these three categories, if you sum them all together, what would the odds ratio be? I know, I understand. Okay, this, this would be the average too, even though it's 1.0, it's just one to one. That's the total going across this way. So what you're looking at here is for never smoking, what's the odds? It's one. They make that one. So this is looking at the odds of smoking, really. So ex-smokers, the odds is 1.3. Current smokers, it's 1.2. So this one, you're forcing into it being one for smoking. So these three are really looking at the impact of smoking. These three are looking at the impact of coffee drinking. And each of these inside here are looking at each one together. Like if you're a never smoker and you drink coffee, what's the odds? I see. So the total is reflecting all of those Because this is the Right. One to two is this one here, the middle one? Yeah. Okay, so see here it's saying that these variables here were adjusted for the other variable in addition to age and sex. So these ones are after you adjust for coffee drinking, what is the impact of smoking? That's why it kind of goes away. Because the point that I'm trying to make is that if I just let everything happen normally, I didn't match on anything, this is how it might fall out, that in general, your cases are going to be smokers. You have 90 out of 100 of your cases are smokers, only 10 out of 100 are not. Um, so in this one, we just let everything happen. So what we really did is we just had the one final table. But when we went back and looked at it, we saw this was the case. Whereas if in advance we matched, then we say, you know what, I'm only getting 10 cases here, so I'm only going to let 20 controls in here. Whereas without paying attention, you had 10 cases here and 160 controls. Um, I guess the question is, um, exposure, are you talking about the alcohol in both of these? Right. And then... So this, you know, so this is smoking, non-smoking. This is alcohol, yes, alcohol, no, and cancer, and no cancer in each of these tables. So what we would have gotten for this is that squish table where you sum them together. And the whole thing is that without understanding this is a problem, you're going to end up really looking at the impact of smoking because you're getting almost all your cases there in the smoking population. All right. Hi. Try, but we're doing a group assignment, so 
Um, if we could get started. We um, still have a bit of stuff to do, so let's just get started. Um, okay, so one of the problems that's really um, a big problem for case control study is problems of recall. And they're really in two different categories. One is just a limitation in recall. It's just measurement error. People can't recall the information, or maybe they never knew the answer to the question. So these are issues that may come up. And this would be the same whether it was a cohort study or any other kind of study, that they just don't know the answer to the question that clearly. What we are really concerned with in a case control study is recall bias. And this is where the cases recall information to a greater degree than the controls. So it's differential recall that may suggest there's a relationship when, in fact, it's just an artifact. There is not a real relationship. So um, one of the ways to help you understand this is to go through some examples. So this was a study looking at um, maternal infections during pregnancy and then whether or not the baby had a congenital malformation. So here you have cases are the mothers of babies with congenital malformations and the controls are mothers of babies without congenital malformation. So here we're going to assume that the true incidence of infection was really 15% in each of these groups. And this is because we went back and looked at medical records and how often did they recall or say during the pregnancy that they had an infection. And so it was about 15% each. However, because these women just had a baby with a congenital malformation, they are recalling falsely that they had a lot more of infections. And so in fact, instead of being 15%, which we think it should be because of the records, it's fourfold higher. It's up around 60%. And so this is a concern because you're going to think that um, Infections are related to congenital malformations, but are they really, or is it just because the person is trying to recall in their mind a reason for why they had a malformation in their baby, and that is what is leading to this finding? So it's just, that's why it's biased. It's not like they just can't remember. They're falsely remembering, and importantly, it's only happening in the case group. You are not seeing the same thing in the control group. And so it can give you a false association. Yes? Well, you might see the same thing, the opposite in the, co in the um, control population. And in fact, what they recalled was a little bit lower than what they actually had. But this was like a fourfold difference, and this just was slightly different. So this study really looked at both of those issues. And in fact, the bigger problem was this false recall by the cases, and that's what we're typically concerned with. So um, another issue in control groups is the use of multiple controls. We've talked about this a little bit so far. But you can have controls of the same type, like two or three controls for each case, and that's just simply to increase the power of the study. You have more controls, you're going to have a higher power. Um, and this is often done. And it's because, you know, you want to make sure that if there's any bias in your control group that it kind of gets washed out by having more controls per case. Oftentimes, we also will do something where you use multiple controls of different types. And that's because they were concerned that the exposure of the hospital control may not represent the rate of exposure expected in the population. For example, your hospitalized patients are more likely going to be smokers than the non-hospitalized patient. Um, and remember, in the pancreatic cancer, we had the pancreatic cancer and coffee drinking that the GI control just drank less coffee. So you want to be careful that whatever that control group is, that it is not biased for some reason. So sometimes we use multiple controls just to try and get at this. So if you were looking at uh, prenatal radiation as a risk factor for um, brain tumors and other cancers in children, this is going to be um, brain tumor cases. And then because you're concerned that there might be recall bias, you say, well, you know what, I'm going to ask other cancer controls because maybe their recall bias would get similar rates. And then I'm going to look at normal controls. So the blue is indicating 
that they are um, the percent of people that say that they had a history of radiation exposure. So is it that both of these are impacted by um, radiation, or is it that both of them have recall bias and that's why you're getting the findings? You know, one of the ways to get at this would be if this brain tumor is the only one, um, you want to just think about which is the potential answer for this, and it's not always that clear. So if, on the other hand, this gives us difficulty in trying to interpret it. Is it really that both are related, perhaps, to um, prenatal radiation? Or is it that both of them suffer from recall bias? It's going to be hard to separate out. If, on the other hand, this is the result we saw, so the prenatal radiation for brain tumors is much higher, and the other cancer controls that might be likely to have recall bias are more like the normal controls, then you can be a little bit more likely to think that radiation exposure is related to brain tumors because you're going to have um, similar recall bias in the brain tumor and the other cancer controls. Since it's not shown there and you still have a higher rate of radiation here, then we can think more clearly that the radiation might be related to the brain tumor cases. So multiple controls can help in these kind of scenarios. Here's another scenario where this is looking at endometrial cancer cases, and they're looking at duration of estrogen use. So they had duration of use here, which is never used all the way up to more than nine years. And then they had different, um, this is each of the cases, the number of cases. Then they had a DNC control, which a DNC is something that you would use to clean out the uterus for some reason because you have abnormal bleeding. You have gynecology controls where they went to the same gynecology practice, and then community controls where they lived in the same area as the case. So if you look at this, for this odds ratio, um, for the DNC comparison, not that strong an increase. At the very high, um, the much longer use of estrogen, it might be starting to be elevated. If you look at the gynecology controls, anything more than about um, five years of use, you're getting a much higher um, odds ratio, and you're getting a higher odds ratio as well as the community controls. So then the authors went back and thought, well, these controls that we use, what is the difference between them? And the reality is that the DNC controls may be overrepresented with estrogen users and that maybe that's why they're showing no association, because women that have, um, are on estrogen might bleed, and therefore they would go and get a DNC. So because of using this control group, if this is all we had, we would say there was no association, and maybe it's just because there's a bias in this control group. But by having the two other controls that both show an elevation here of risk with endometrial cancer, we can be more assured that there actually is a true risk. So again, source of controls is important, and that's why sometimes you use multiple controls to try and control for different aspects that maybe are important in the relationship between the disease and exposure you're interested in. Okay, um, one other way that we do a case control study is something called a nested case control study. And this is a case control study that's nested within a cohort study. And um, the population is in a defined cohort, say the Framingham study. They already had baseline surveys. They had samples collected over time. The cases are people who develop disease over the course of this cohort study. And your controls are usually randomly chosen from the rest of the population from the people who did not develop that disease. Um, and so that is just shown um, schematically here where you have your defined cohort. And from this, you might have data on serum, urine, other specimens. And the important thing is all of these were collected before these people became the cases. So you end up getting um, data on these people that develop the disease. They come into your case group. And then, of course, there's a lot more people that haven't developed the disease. And you will take a subgroup of these and select them as your controls. And maybe you'll match on a couple of variables. But in that way, you can do a case control study, um, but you're getting rid of the whole question of whether the exposure really preceded the disease. Because in this case, you know your exposure preceded the disease. So why do this? Why not just use the cohort results? 
The reason why people do this is sometimes you want to look at something here that's a pretty expensive test to do. Say we wanted to do genetic testing on samples. We can't afford to do it on 10,000 people, but we could take these people and maybe do it on 200, and it would be much less expensive. So oftentimes this is used for something where you're concerned about the cost of whatever exposure you're looking at, and that would be one reason to do this but it does have a lot of exam, um, advantages. So and in the NACE, uh, nested case control study, you have your cohort, and then you might have people who develop the disease. So here's different cases that develop the disease. Um, here's case one, case two, and cases three and four. So in some cases, you would choose the control as someone who at year one had not yet developed the disease because that's when the case was found. And this one would be matched by year two, and these by the end of four years. And so there's different ways of collecting this. And then you know, case five would be the fifth year, and so we would choose control, um, control five at the end of five years as being someone without the disease. It's one way you can choose the controls to match your cases is by a time frame within the cohort, at which point they did not have disease. So there's several advantages and limitations of a nested um, case control design. The data are collected before the disease develops, so you're not going to have recall bias. Um, the specimens were collected years before the disease began, and so if there are any factors, risk factors that come into play and are like before the disease is diagnosed, you might see changes in blood work or something, you wouldn't be faced with that as being an issue. And importantly, it's oftentimes done because it's cheaper than analyzing all samples for all cohort members for the risk factor. So just to go through an example of a nested case control study, I'm just going to go through one study where um, this was basically looking at the NYU Women's Health Study, and there's almost 15, there's about 14,000 people in this. But people wanted to do blood measurements on serum carotenoids, and they're expensive, and look at it in um, relation to breast cancer. So instead of doing analysis on blood samples of 14,000 women, they looked at um, 270 cases and 270 controls. And they split it into people that were premenopausal breast cancer and postmenopausal breast cancer. So at baseline, all these women had completed a questionnaire, and they had blood samples taken. So this was before they had the breast cancer diagnosis. So it's not going to be impacted by recall bias. The blood samples aren't going to be impacted by the disease state. Um, in this women's health study, all of the breast cancer cases are identified by patient contact, as well as tumor registries for the different states where they think the cases might have gone to. <laughs> And they looked at anyone who was diagnosed more than six months after entry to try and get rid of any pre-morbid disease. If, you know, within a few weeks or a month or two of coming in, they got the disease, they might be concerned that that would have impacted the baseline um, findings. So they looked at seven different carotenoids to try and see if any of these were related to the risk of breast cancer. Um, they knew that there were certain confounders that they wanted to think about, and these confounders are because they might relate to carotenoid consumption, they might relate to breast cancer disease. So age at menarche is a strong risk factor, age at first full-time pregnancy, parity or how many children you have, whether there's breast cancer in a relative, if the individual ever had benign breast disease, and then BMI or quetelet index. So there are some things that they felt are such a strong risk factor, they just put in the model regardless of whether they were um, found to be different. And that included agent menarche um, parity and BMI. So all of those things were already in the model to look at this carotenoid and breast cancer association. The ones that are in italics, they did something that some of your papers talk about doing too, where they put this in and looked at the end result and said, okay, with this variable in, it changes the result by more than 15%, so I'm going to keep it in. So each one of the ones in italics, they kind of tested to see if they made a difference for the results. So this is the baseline um, characteristics of the subject. So again, 270 cases, 270 controls. 
On average, they were about 52 years of age. Their age at menarche was, um, that's the year that you get your first period, was about 12.4, um, 12.6. This is the age at first pregnancy. Whether they had no children, a little bit higher in the cases than the controls. Their age at menopause, BMI, family history of breast cancer, and history of benign breast disease. So those were the study subject characteristics for both the cases and controls within this nested cohort. Then they looked at the serum concentration of all of these different carotenoids as well as retinol at the baseline. In this study, these are the values that they got for each of these individuals. So beta carotene, something you're very familiar with. Here's the level in the cases. Here's the level in the controls. But now what they wanted to do is see how these nutrients related to breast cancer. Um, they did odds ratios of breast cancer for each quartile of the serum carotenoid concentration. So what you have here is the highest quartile, they assigned one, and then as you had less and less intake of each of these carotenoids, these are the odds ratios that you get. So if you look at this, can anyone tell me where it seems like there might be a significant impact of having low intake on getting breast cancer for which of these? Yes. Cryptoxanthine? Right, so both of these, and they're kind of circled so it helps you, but anyway, both of these seem to find an association. So I wanna just go through how these um, results are shown so that you can um, be better at doing this by yourself. So here at the lowest intake of lutein, you can see that the odds ratio was two. Here's the 95% confidence interval, 1.1 to 3.9. So is that significant? It is, right? Because one is not included in this. Now the other thing that they show here is something called a P for trend. And what that is saying is if we look at the results going from high to next highest to the next highest to the lowest, is there a trend that says your risk gets greater and greater as you get less and less lutein intake? And that's what this p-value says. And this can be significant sometimes without any of these individual odds ratios being significant. Because for each one of these, you're only looking at one quarter of the population. For the trend, you're looking at all 270 cases and 270 controls. And that's why sometimes you'll find a p-value for the trend might be significant when the rest is not. So do you understand the difference of looking at each individual odds ratio for each category or quartile of um, blood as compared to the trend where it's looking at how much is the risk changing as you go lower and lower intakes, do you get greater and greater risk? And that's what a p-value for trend looks. Okay, so those are the two things you can find. Um, and then this table goes on to alpha carotene, beta carotene, and total carotenoids. And you can find that there was an increased risk of breast cancer with low intake of many of these carotenoids. Um, and you can see that the p-values for the trends were extremely um, small. So it was a very significant finding in terms of these nutrients. So, um, In this case cohort study, what they're doing is really taking a defined cohort and seeing if they develop disease. So these were the 270 people that developed disease instead of just the five shown here. And then at the end of the study, they chose the five controls or when they chose these cases that at that time point had no um, disease. So um, the major advantage of the case control study is that yes, maybe we're looking at exposed to A, which is say high levels of serum carotenoids and not exposed to A. But at the same time, we can be looking at multiple other risk factors and that's what B and C are representing here. So in the cases, yes, we're finding out about um, serum carotenoids, but we're also asking questions to get at these other variables as well in both the case group and the control group. So, um, when we analyze, yes? They're both really nested, but this one is called a case cohort study where it's more defined at the end of the study. 
And the nested case control where I showed you this thing here is more taking for each time period, like you're interested in the time until the disease develops. And if that's one of your interests, then you might want to do it in this way as compared to the waiting till the end of the study and seeing who had the disease or not. So it's just two different ways selecting them, and in part it has to do with how important it is to get, you know, a, when the case develops. This was the example. I mean, the reason why I put this here is this is how they did this. Okay. So um, in order to look at the analysis of a case control study, a lot of times you'll see that they've done logistic regression analysis, including important covariates. Um, if it's frequency matched, you include all these matching variables as covariates. What I talked about earlier, if we do individual matching, there's a whole different analysis way that you have to do it. You have to treat these as pairs, and we'll go through that um, analysis in a few weeks. So I want to talk about the other one where it's just frequency matched like this. Um, so the logistic regression, remember, it's where you're kind of getting a, um, your odds ratio in this case for breast cancer, is going to be equal to your serum carotenoids, and then you're also going to be, say, plus age, plus menarche, you know, all of the things that they said were important. And so all of these things will just go into a model. And on this side is going to be yes or no. Either they got breast cancer or they didn't. And then what we're looking for all along here is, okay, these are the different levels of serum carotenoids, but we're controlling for everything here. So when we do this, we're really saying, how do serum carotenoids impact breast cancer if we get rid of the effect of everything else that's in the equation? And that's what a logistic regression does. So what you usually see is not as much the model building when you read the papers, but you're going to see something like this where this is a case control study of breast cancer. And you have all of these different variables um, that they're looking at. So if we look at here, um, age at first birth. Remember we said that's a risk factor? So this comes up with, if you look at age at first birth here, you can see that the odds ratio is 1.3. Now, importantly, when you um, interpret this, it means that there's a 30% or a 1.3-fold increased risk for every 10-year increase in age at first birth. So I want you to get used to thinking about what units are they talking about when they give you the variables, because that'll help you understand the study a little bit better. Um, if you look at um, history of benign breast disease, that's just a yes or no. Either you had it or you didn't have it. So if you look at the history of benign breast disease, here you can see the odds ratio is 1.6, and here's your limits, your confidence limits, and you can see that this is significant because it didn't include one, whereas the age at first birth did include one, and that was not significant. So with this confidence interval here being 1.6 and then this being the range, you can rule out the odds of uh, odds ratio being less than 1.2 or greater than 2.3 with 95% confidence. That's how you think about these findings when you see them in a table um, or the results. So this is, um, and then I, this is just described in words on the next slide. Um, so the age at first birth, I said the odds ratio is 1.3, so the odds of being a case are increased 30% because it's 1.3 for each 10-year increase in age at first birth. So just to, you know, kind of walk you three through what the analysis would look like in papers like what you were assigned to read for today. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to expect you to know how to do a logistic regression, but I want you to understand what you're getting in the tables and where it came from you know, in a more general way. So what we're going to be talking about in the future, today we talked about case control studies, we're going to go into cohort studies, and then into randomized controlled trials. So for now, um, let's see, I want to just go through the readings, but I also have an in-class assignment.
so